Okay, hi everyone. I'm back for another episode of uh, Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And I noticed that there are a few questions that got left over from last time, so maybe I can start with some of those. So the first question I see uh, is from Z Hammer. What is the difference between fusion and fission? So these are both stories about nuclear physics and uh, what they're about. They're both ways to make energy from nuclei. And um, uh, so the nucleus of an atom is what's at the center of the atom. It's made of basically protons and neutrons and uh, the different atoms, the different types of elements that are in the periodic table, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, and so on. Each separate kind of element has progressively one more proton. So hydrogen has one proton, helium has two protons, lithium has three protons and so on, all the way up to uh, uranium, which has uh, 92 protons. And there are other elements that go up to about 115 uh, protons beyond that. And each kind of uh, nucleus can have varying numbers of neutrons as well. So the most common form of hydrogen most common isotope of hydrogen has one proton and zero neutrons, but there's also deuterium, which is one proton and one neutron. There's tritium, which is one proton and two neutrons. Those are, all three of those are isotopes of hydrogen. They're all hydrogen because they all have the same number of protons, namely one. They're different isotopes because they have different numbers of neutrons. Okay, so that's atomic nuclei. Um, the, uh, what are fission and fusion? So, one thing is when you break an atomic nucleus apart, it's hard to do because there's a, a strong forces that, that uh, hold together the protons and neutrons in the nucleus. If you break it apart, if you break apart a uranium atom with its, like let's say 230 something protons and neutrons in it, if you break it apart, it will make energy when you break it apart. Uh, somewhat confusingly, when you take, uh, if you take two uranium atoms, you try and smoosh them together, uh, don't, don't get energy by doing that. But if you take two hydrogen atoms and you smoosh those together, you get energy as those, as, uh, as those combine into another nucleus. So what's happening? In, in, uh, in fission, that's breaking things apart, you're taking a big nucleus and you're breaking it in pieces um, to make smaller nuclei and you get energy in that process. In fusion, you're taking uh, typically smaller nuclei and you're smushing them together and getting energy in that process too. Okay, so now we have to try to explain why it is the case. Well, let's talk about where fission and fusion show up. Um, and then we'll talk about why it's the case that you both get energy by fusing small nuclei and breaking apart big nuclei. Um, so the uh, uh, so first of all, where do these things show up? So uh, fission is what is was the original idea for nuclear weapons, and it's what powers nuclear power stations. And usually, what happens is there's uh, one takes uranium or plutonium, um, other sometimes some other elements, but usually those two. Those are both heavy elements with lots of protons and neutrons. And uh, you get energy in a nuclear reactor, for example, by having those nuclei get broken apart. So that's an example of fission. Um, the first nuclear bombs were made with fission uh, using uranium and plutonium. Um, that's another example of fission. Okay, fusion. The most famous place that fusion happens is in stars like the sun. It's what makes the energy of, of something like the sun is the fusion, in the case of the sun, mostly of hydrogen nuclei, uh, fusing together to make helium and so on. You can also make hydrogen bombs that actually are usually made with, I think, lithium deuteride, um, not strictly hydrogen, but they're, they're, those are fusion bombs. And somewhat, again, confusingly, you need the energy of a fission explosion to start a fusion bomb explosion. Um, and, uh, but fusion bombs work by, so-called hydrogen bombs work by, again, doing the same kind of thing that the sun does of, of smooshing together small nuclei to make energy. 
Now, people have been trying to make the analog of nuclear power stations with fusion for about 60 years now um, and trying to set it up so that you kind of recreate the conditions inside the sun, very high temperatures, but but so um, atoms having be having been pushed together, they're trying to make it so that that works in um, uh, in in a, in something like a power station. And there are for a long time it was like this just doesn't work. It's it's really hard to keep uh, the plasma, the very um, the the uh, just nuclei without their electrons going around them uh, to keep that very uh, uh, you know million degrees centigrade type plasma or whatever it is to keep it contained as opposed to just squirting out in all directions because to have it be the case that these nuclei can actually fuse you need them to get rammed together hard enough that this fusion process can actually happen and in order to do that you have to confine these things in a in a sort of container um, that uh, that can contain them. Now, question is, what do you have? What can you get that can contain a thing at a million degrees, for example? Well, the sun doesn't have that problem because the sun is held together by gravity. The sun is very big and held together by gravity. So it's, it's all of its hydrogen is all being pulled together by the gravity of the sun. Um, but if you're just in some backyard or you know power station sized device, certainly the force of gravity doesn't get to do that. So you have to have some way to confine the plasma, this very, let's say million degrees um, uh, thing um, to be able to, to get its nuclei to smash together hard enough to fuse, to release energy. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, the only way one knows to do that is using magnetic fields to confine the plasma. So there's no physical material, you know, the highest temperatures, I think, uh, what is it? It's, um, I think tungsten is actually up there. It's not actually the winner for the highest temperature um, uh, melting point, but it's like 6,000 degrees centigrade or something. Um, it's tiny compared to the temperatures that you need to uh, get enough energy to make nuclear fusion happen. So you need something other than a physical material to contain uh, the, the, the plasma for nuclear fusion. And the only way people have figured out to do that is use magnetic fields. The problem is to make something which is like a bottle, a magnetic bottle where there's magnetic field all around is really hard. I mean, you have a bar magnet and it has a certain magnetic field that comes out of it, but it doesn't enclose anything. So making a magnetic field that is successfully encloses things is really difficult. There are two basic schemes, the so-called tokamaks and stellarators which are two different weird shapes of magnetic field. They're weird, weird, weird shapes that try to arrange it so that not only, well, there are a couple, there are many different problems, but, but one of them is sort of have a magnetic field which sort of can contain things and then have it be the case that as the particles, they're, they're typically, they're, they're donut shaped things, they're ring shaped things. Um, as, the, as the particles go around these rings that they not, uh, come back to the same place again in such a way that the it's kind of like a like when you're if you're on a swing and you're sort of pumping yourself on the swing um, you're you're you know you're making your legs move um, in sort of uh, to in resonance with the time when the swing comes to the right place. Well, the same thing can happen in a plasma, but it's really bad in a plasma because instead of making on a swing you might make yourself go higher by doing that kind of pumping thing, but in a plasma. The, uh, if, if these particles sort of pump themselves, they eventually just go, go in the wrong direction and they escape the magnetic bubble, the, the magnetic bottle that's been created. So anyway, people have been trying to do uh, a controlled fusion for power stations for about 60 years. Um, there are, there's a big effort in the south of France called ITER. That's a big many country effort to make a giant uh, version of this that might be ready in, in the 2030s. It's not clear. It's been postponed several times. There are also now about 20 companies, uh, startup companies around the world that say, we're going to do nuclear fusion. fusion. We're really going to make it work this time. And uh, I hope it does work because if it does work, it's very it's very nice because uh, the, the, the fuel source for nuclear fusion is just hydrogen, which you can get from water. It's, it's a completely renewable fuel and it's sort of uh, perfect clean energy, so to speak. The only problem is you actually have to make it work. There was a hope about 20 years ago that it might be possible to do cold fusion to make it uh, to make. See, the problem of fusion is if you can ram two protons together hard enough, they will essentially stick 
and more or less turn into a, a helium nucleus. Um, but uh, uh, you have to ram them together really hard. And why do you have to ram them together really hard? Well, uh, because they're electrically charged things, they have both have plus uh, a positive charge and like charges repel. And so when two protons, you just get them go closer and closer and closer, they'll, they'll just bounce away from each other because of their electric charge. And so you have to ram them together hard enough that you can break through the kind of um, barrier associated with the, the forces from their electric charge to have them actually stick. And I think I talked another time about the strong nuclear force, which is the force that, that holds the, um, the uh, protons and neutrons in a nucleus together. Okay, so it was it, at one time about 20 years ago, there was an idea that it might be possible to do cold fusion. Instead of, instead of getting these things to, to uh, combine by just ramming them together really by making them at a very high temperature where they're going very fast, that there might be a way to make fusion happen by, for example, that what was used was a material called palladium, an element called palladium, so similar to silver. Um, and palladium has the feature that, that hydrogen dissolves in palladium. Like you think you put you know, sugar into water or something, it will dissolve. Salt into water, it dissolves. Um, but you can also have a gas effectively dissolve in a solid, and that's what happens in hydrogen gas and palladium. And palladium kind of soaks in tons and tons and tons of hydrogen. And so it seemed like it might be the case that it was soaking so much hydrogen in that these hydrogens were getting sort of stuffed in so hard that they might get close enough that they could actually undergo nuclear fusion but it doesn't seem like that effect is large enough to be important. And um, uh, it was um, uh, kind of has, has sort of um, uh, the attempts to, to make that work have, have so far failed. Okay, so the question you might then ask is uh, why, why is it possible to get energy both by fusing together small nuclei and by breaking apart large nuclei? And the answer is it's kind of subtle um, and has to do with the um, different, well, let's see it, see if I can figure this out. Um, ba, 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 ba. Okay, so there are effects from the bulk and there are effects from the surface of the nucleus. And well, the end result is there's a curve that basically just shows the so-called binding energy per nucleon, the amount of energy that's, that, is, that sticks together the nucleus um, as, uh, as a function of how big the nucleus is. And the, the, um, the maximum binding energy per nucleon is for the isotope iron 56. Um, isotope of iron that has 56 total protons and neutrons, that's the nucleus which is the most tightly bound together. And every other nucleus is less tightly bound together. So what happens is, because you have this curve that says, you know, hydrogen is less tightly bound than helium, which is less tightly bound than lithium, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What does this mean? This means if you could only take pieces of hydrogen and stick them together, they would be, the result would be more tightly bound than, than the things that it started from. What does it mean that it's more tightly bound? Well, it means that it is, it is kind of, uh, it, you, get, you get energy as a result of the fact that you go from the state where, so let me give you an analogy. Um, if you have um, something, if you have two planets and they are going to be, and they can, oh, no, two stars, and the stars can get captured by each other and go into orbit as a binary star system, that, that, that they're being pulled together by the force of gravity and the, um, uh, the result, well, this is a little bit tricky. One's, um, this, this requires that I kind of explain some stuff about potential energy versus kinetic energy and so on. Let me, let me not go so far down this path. Let me just say that, that the, the basic point is, if you have more binding energy, then uh, you are, if, if you go from a state with less binding energy to a state with more binding energy, you can release energy as kinetic energy of motion because as you conserve energy, some of the energy is being used just bind these things together. And so some other energy can get released as kinetic energy, more or less. Um, the amount of energy that's released is kind of, it's kind of like converting a piece of the mass of the nucleus into energy. And so there's that friendly formula E equals MC squared. Energy is equal to the mass times the speed of light squared 
that's um, Albert Einstein's famous formula. And that tells you sort of how much energy will be released as you, uh, it's sort of the, the trade-off as the, as, the, as the effective mass. Now, this is a little bit complicated because you can kind of read off from the periodic table. When you read off the line that says atomic mass and you work out uh, atomic mass gives you the kind of mass after you take account of binding energy. And so by just looking at those values, you can figure out this thing that I'm telling you about the fact that the binding energy per nucleon, per proton and neutron, is, is maximum for high M56 and goes down both for smaller nuclei and for larger nuclei. So that means if you are a smaller nucleus and you can combine to make a bigger nucleus, you can use up that binding energy to make actual energy. You can release energy by combining these nuclei together. And similarly, on the other side, um, because the uh, binding energy goes down as you go to bigger nuclei, um, for big nuclei, that means that by taking a big nucleus and splitting it into smaller nuclei, you can again get energy in, going in that direction. So in, uh, you know, we humans have made nuclear fission first done in 1945, I guess maybe 44, 40, 1945-ish. Um, the, uh, was, um, actually maybe, maybe the first controlled fission was slightly before that, um, um, early 1940s. Um, in any case, we, we, we humans made fission happen uh, uh, for ourselves. Some amount of spontaneous fission is happening, in fact, the way we got started with, with fission as created um, by, by humans was using natural fission because some big nuclei, particularly uh, 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 uranium-235, isotope-235 of uranium, um, has the feature that it undergoes spontaneous fission. So you take a uranium-235 nucleus, it's got 235 protons and neutrons in it, 92 protons and 235 minus 92 neutrons, and uranium-235 is unstable. It, it just falls apart. But it takes it, on average, a billion years to fall apart, more than a billion years. And so that means that uranium that was created when the Earth was created four and a half billion years ago, there's uranium that was created even when the Earth was created that's still around because it hasn't all decayed yet because it takes on average billions of years for a uranium uh, nucleus to 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 uh, to decay, and it, it decays by breaking apart through spontaneous fission. So some amount of fission happens spontaneously. When, when uranium-235 breaks apart, it's kind of a messy process. It, it typically, it falls apart into, into two nuclei. It's not always the same two nuclei. It just sort of, just sort of it, isn't, it isn't strong enough to maintain itself, and it just bloop, falls apart. Okay, so that happens spontaneously. The, there's another place where fission happens, um, that is important for, for us, which is uh, in supernovas. Um, and uh, so in a supernova, supernova is the, a type two supernova is the collapse of a, of a massive star. Uh, our sun won't, won't have a supernova, but if it was bigger than our, our sun, it, it, if a star bigger than our sun can uh, undergo a supernova explosion at the, sort of at the end of its life. And what happens is, I mentioned the sun is, well, people say burning hydrogen. It's not burning in the usual sense of burning. It's uh, undergoing hydrogen in the sun is undergoing nuclear fusion, turning into helium. Uh, the sun has a little bit of helium turning into things like lithium and, and so on, into heavier elements. But what happens is as stars get, um, as stars are sort of pulled in more by gravity, um, they, they get more and more helium, more and more lithium and other, other elements in them but they need more and more to, to those, those nuclei have higher charges. And so they need even higher temperatures to get them to, to uh, smoosh together and, um, and, undergo, um, uh, and undergo nuclear fusion. And so what happens is bigger stars, there's enough kind of gravitational, uh, they, they, things get sort of uh, pulled together enough by gravity that you end up getting those higher temperatures. You can get uh, nuclear fusion in higher, uh, of higher, uh, higher elements. And what happens is at the end of, the, of a big star's life, so to speak, there'll come this moment when the star is collapsing and um, it's, it's, it's used up a bunch of its hydrogen, it's turned it into heavier elements, but the heavier elements uh, are still sort of bouncing off each other. They don't quite have, they don't quite 
get, get over the potential barrier associated with charge, but eventually the star will collapse on itself and it will, as it collapses, it will be able to push these things closer together and let them uh, undergo nuclear fusion. And what actually happens is the star collapses and it all happens very explosively. It collapses, 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 and it speeds up its collapse and in matters of, of I don't know what it is, uh, years to days to minutes, um, it, uh, it's collapsing, collapsing, collapsing. And eventually it gets to the point where elements like oxygen and silicon have been produced and they have their much heavier elements and those elements eventually can get um, to the point where the star is sort of pushing them together enough that they start undergoing nuclear fusion and this all happens. It all kind of becomes a runaway process and kaboom, there's a giant explosion. And uh, the last one we could see uh, with the naked eye from the earth was in 1054 AD, the formation of the Crab Nebula. Um, I think it was a, it was, uh, the explosion was, was intense enough that I think it made the night sky bright for a few days. Um, and uh, so it's got a very, very powerful explosion that happens as a result of the sort of the suddenly the ability to do nuclear fusion with these heavier elements. Okay, so that's how that works. But in the process of that happening, in this sort of runaway uh, nuclear explosion in a, in a supernova, uh, there's also um, that things run away so much that you actually get um, a formation of heavy elements through uh, a process that is essentially a fusion process. So you're going from lighter elements to heavier elements, even though I said in general, heavier elements make energy by, by breaking apart. In a supernova, there's so much energy there that you can make heavy elements just from the energy associated with the supernova. And um, that's, that's basically how all the heavy elements that we have um, in the earth, for example, were made. So all the gold that we find on the earth, you know, gold occurs in the earth's crust about one in every, um, uh, one in every 10 billion atoms in the earth's crust is a gold atom. Every one of those gold atoms came from a supernova. So the, the, we are, if, if we had existed earlier in the history of our universe, we would have been, or, or in the history of our galaxy for that matter, um, our galaxy probably at the beginning was uh, sort of had first generation stars that didn't have a bunch of these heavy elements. But after the, there was a first generation of stars that lasted maybe only millions of years. And those stars had supernovas and generated heavy elements that can then be used and recycled. And so we are, you know, we are the ultimate recycling story that our heavy elements like gold, for example, are all in fact, everything above iron 56 is, has to be made this way, um, is, uh, are all consequences of, um, uh, of essentially supernovas. Now I should explain, by the way, just for sort of completeness, how did the elements beyond hydrogen, well, how, how did any of these things get made? Well, they were made in the early universe in the Big Bang. The Big Bang, at the beginning of the universe, the universe is expanding. At the beginning of the universe, the universe was tiny and was extremely hot, probably in some sense, infinitely hot. Um, and uh, at that temperature, you can make all kinds of things. So one of the big things that got made was um, uh, maybe a second after the beginning of the universe, um, things were very hot and, and, and uh, it was when things were sufficiently hot, even nuclei couldn't hold together. But um, eventually nuclei started holding together and um, the, uh, uh, actually maybe it's, maybe it's more like a few minutes after the beginning of the universe. Yeah, maybe, a few, maybe three or four minutes after the beginning of the universe was sort of the most significant time for this. Of when uh, you start forming uh, helium nuclei, you can get fusion occurring and you can form helium nuclei. So one of the big facts in the universe is about a quarter of as much helium as there is hydrogen. That was all formed in the first few minutes of the universe. And that's sort of a fundamental constant and back uh, a long time ago um, in the early 1980s, people started, um, uh, I was slightly involved in this, this uh, uh, in things related to this enterprise of um, trying to figure out how much uh, how much helium would get produced in the early universe is about a quarter as much hydrogen. As you go and look at the heavier elements, less and less and less of those heavy elements were produced. As you go to heavier and heavier elements, less and less of those things were produced in the early universe. And then the only way to produce these really heavy elements ended up being in, in things like supernovas. So that's, a, a, uh, uh, that's the story of, of uh, nuclear fusion and nuclear fission.
Uh, okay, we got a few, oh gosh, so many questions here. Um, uh, okay, there's one fairly simple one here from Sarsa Perilla. Uh, what's the difference in regular helium, like in a balloon and helium three? Okay. So uh, I mentioned you have these different kinds of atoms. Uh, the periodic table is basically a catalog of all the different kinds of atoms that exist. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, uh, each one of those is a different kind of atom. It's distinguished by the number of protons in its nucleus. And that number of protons in its nucleus tells you the number of electrons that the atom should have to, uh, to counteract the electric charge of the protons. So if there's a, a something with um, you know, 10 protons in the nucleus, in its simplest form, an atom of that material will have 10 electrons. Uh, chemistry works by kind of messing around with those electrons and different atoms swapping electrons to make covalent bonds and things, or different atoms having, uh, having uh, uh, electrons um, that, that are, uh, displaced to make ionic bonds, those kinds of things. Um, the, uh, but so, so the story of the chemical properties of materials is all about the story of how many protons they have, because that determines how many electrons they have, and the electrons are what affect the chemistry of materials. Okay, but if you look in the nucleus of, a, of, a, um, uh, uh, of an atom, it is a bunch of protons, that determines the electric charge of the atom, determines the number of electrons, plus a bunch of neutrons. And the neutrons are just sort of hanging out there, coming along for the ride. Um, the uh, uh, neutrons in a nucleus are stable particles. Actually, if you were to isolate a neutron, strangely enough, it decays in about a thousand seconds. A neutron on its own, it, it just barely is unstable. It decays into a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. Um, and, uh, but that happens in about a thousand seconds. So there are no, the, you, you don't get sort of free neutrons around the place, but you do get neutrons inside an atom. The, essentially the, the fact that the thing is bound inside the atom means that it can't, uh, it doesn't, uh, there, there's no, it would have to uh, usually, okay, so if you take the, the mass of the proton, the mass of an electron and the mass of a neutrino, add them together, that mass is less than the mass of a neutron. So that means the neutron can turn into those particles and the, the extra energy associated with that mass just becomes the kinetic energy of those particles. But when a neutron is bound inside an atom, then normally in, in any stable atom, the neutron just can't, the energy doesn't work out. The binding energy overcomes the energy that the neutron would have, sort of the excessive energy the neutron would have to be able to decay into a proton, electron, neutron, uh, neutrino. And so it, it can't decay. So the neutron is then stable inside the atom. Now in some atoms, in, in some isotopes, there are too many neutrons. And when there are too many neutrons, the neutrons will be able to decay in more or less the same way a neutron, a free neutron decays. So for example, for hydrogen, the, a single proton is the simplest isotope of hydrogen. Another isotope of hydrogen is deuterium, which is a proton and a neutron in the nucleus. The next isotope of hydrogen is called tritium. It's so-called hydrogen three and um, hydrogen three, it's called three because it has three particles in its nucleus, uh, a proton and two neutrons. Uh, tritium decays with a lifetime of about, um, I don't know, 15 years or something. And um, its decay is it's like one of those neutrons wasn't attached well enough and it, it could still have the energy to decay. So tritium undergoes what's called beta decay, which is decay by emission of an electron. Electrons used to be called beta particles back in the day um, when they were first being discovered in the, uh, around 1900. Um, and um, so, well, actually the story is a little bit more complicated than that, but, but roughly where, where beta particles were, were, when they were discovered as part of radioactivity, they were, it was called beta particles. It was only later realized that beta, beta radiation was electrons being emitted. But anyway, so, so tritium decays by essentially one of its neutrons falling apart into a proton, uh, an electron and a neutrino, antineutrino. And so that means as that falls apart, what gets left over is two protons and a neutron. So what's happened is 
that it's it's turned into um, that the that tritium hydrogen three has turned into helium three. It's called helium three because it's got two protons. That make that means it's helium, and it's got a neutron as well. That means it's got a total of three particles in its nucleus. So that means it's the an isotope with a um, uh, well, a nominal atomic mass of three. It isn't exactly three, but because of because of these binding energy effects that I'm talking about. But but it has a a uh, um, a, an a number um, that is um, that's just the name of it in nuclear physics. Um, that uh, usually the the um, uh, the number of protons is called z, and the number of protons plus neutrons is called a. Um, the uh, um, uh, that that um, that number is three, so that's an example. So two protons, one neutron is helium three. So uh, someone is asking about helium three, and um, uh, so that's what helium three is: two protons and a neutron. It so happens that for helium, there are two stable isotopes. Uh, I mentioned for hydrogen, there are two stable isotopes, protium, which is just ordinary hydrogen, one proton, also deuterium, a proton and neutron. As soon as you get more neutrons, it becomes unstable, tritium and then helium, uh, hydrogen four is unstable with a much shorter lifetime and so on. So with helium, there are two stable isotopes, helium three and helium four. Helium four, which is the more common isotope, is uh, two protons and two neutrons. Um, and that um, uh, as soon as you get, uh, there are other isotopes of helium like helium five and so on. I don't know offhand what their lifetimes are, but they are unstable. Um, undoubtedly helium five undergoes beta decay emitting an electron um, and so on. Uh, so, so helium three is, so in, a, in, a, in your average helium balloon, you get the helium that existed on the earth, which is a mixture of helium four and helium three. Um, and uh, the ratio of helium-4 and helium-3 was determined pretty much by the production of helium during the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe. And the ratio is, ba -ba 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 -ba, do I remember? I don't remember, I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, but it was, um, helium-3 is quite rare compared to helium-4. Um, helium, uh, uh, helium is, a, is, a, is a gas. Um, it's a very, um, uh, it's a gas that has a, um, uh, a lower density than ordinary air. And so helium floats on air. So if you make a balloon that's full of helium, then the balloon, most of its mass is, is the helium inside it. It will float on air, so to speak. Um, so it will go up in, in the air. And the reason there isn't more helium around here is because helium, if there was any helium in the Earth's atmosphere, it would float up and eventually escape from the atmosphere. Earth's gravity is not strong enough to pull down helium, so to speak. And uh, the same is true on most other planets. But for example, on Jupiter and Saturn and so on, the big planets, uh, and Jupiter, Jupiter has enough mass, has enough gravity that helium does not escape from the gravitational field of Jupiter. So the, the atmosphere of Jupiter is, is full of hydrogen and helium, which don't escape because of, there's enough gravity in, um, uh, on Jupiter to prevent those things from escaping. On the Earth, there isn't enough gravity and, and it escapes. So, uh, and, and to get to find helium on the Earth, it, it's, it's trapped in rocks um, from, when the, from when the Earth was originally formed. Um, I think there's probably a lot of helium to be mined from the Earth, but people sometimes worry that we're going to run out. Um, I knew some people who had a rather peculiar scheme that involved mining helium-3 from the moon. Um, I don't completely know why this makes sense, um, because I think there's plenty of it on the Earth. Um, you just have to dig deeper in the rocks, but I'm not sure. Um, helium-4 and helium-3 have a number of interesting differences, usually different isotopes behave chemically exactly the same. They, they usually, a lot of their properties are really very much the same. Um, for the very, like for example, if you look at, I don't know, tungsten or something, my favorite element, element number 74, it's my favorite element because if you look on a periodic table, the chemical symbol for tungsten is W because in many languages, the name for tungsten is Wolfram or, or, or some, uh, some variant of that and, um, no, it was not a distant relative of mine who discovered tungsten. Um, although I was disappointed when I was a kid that um, 
Uh, it's one of many reasons that I didn't go into chemistry. No, this is this is a silly story and not really true. But but um, it's a, it's it's a it's a it's one of those could be true stories but isn't. Is like uh, it's like I realized if I'm you know no no chemical element could ever be named after me because uh, there's already tungsten element 74, which is already has symbol W and is already called Wolfram in many countries. Um, it's, uh, um, you know, actually the, the general rule about having uh, elements named after you, some of the, some of the, uh, the very heavy elements that are now being discovered, element 110, element, uh, et cetera, these are named after people. But generally the rule had been, you don't get an element named after you until you're dead. Um, although I think for Glenn Seaborg, an exception was made for Seaborgium, which is element 116, maybe something like that. Um, the, uh, but in any case, most of the, um, uh, you know, there are elements named Einsteinium, uh, Lorentzium named after um, Ernest Lorentz, who was very much involved in these things. Uh, Meitnerium named after Lisa Meitner, who was involved in the whole nuclear fission uh, business. There are a bunch of bun bunch of elements named after people who are involved in the sort of nuclear business in the 1930s and 1940s. But in any case, um, so uh, uh, what was I going to say? I was I was talking about. Um, uh, sorry, that was a that was an irrelevant segue. I I um, irrelevant digression. I, I have to say one of the things that has happened to me, at least in the past, is um, uh, because tungsten is um, is often is called Wolfram in many languages. Um, it's uh, if I meet people who are from who don't know English that well, and uh, they certainly don't know the name for for tungsten in English. And um, I remember um, uh, meeting people from from various countries um, in the past who were involved in 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 uh, uh, let's say the government or business in those countries, and they you know uh, saw my name or the name of my company, which happens to be Wolfram Research, and they're like they'd start talking to me about tungsten mining, and it's like uh, no 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 that's just my name it has nothing to do with tungsten really it's not. And, um, and I think I also, I get a certain amount of spam of people trying to sell me various kinds of tungsten, um, uh, tungsten type uh, things um, because of that also. But anyway, that was irrelevant. An element like tungsten has a whole bunch of stable isotopes, maybe five or so, I don't remember exactly how many for tungsten. Um, as you get up to these heavier elements, there tend to be more stable isotopes, at least for a while, um, until after uranium when there aren't any, when the elements don't have, any stable isotopes at all, at least not, none of the elements we know of have any stable isotopes after that. Um, so, uh, but when you're down at the, uh, the light elements, there are a modest number of stable isotopes, maybe a couple. Now, normally with different isotopes, there are very few differences that you can detect in sort of the everyday uh, use of the material. So for example, there are no chemical differences because the number of electrons is still the same. There are very few physical differences because the materials that you get by just changing the number of neutrons in the nucleus just don't differ very much. Sometimes people really care about the difference between two isotopes. For example, the isotope uranium-235 is the isotope you need to make to make nuclear fission happen. It undergoes spontaneous fission, as I mentioned. Uranium-238 is the more common isotope of uranium, and it doesn't do anything useful. Well, it does do useful things, actually. Uranium-238 is a very high-density material. And for example, it's used sometimes for counterweights. I, I think on the, on the Boeing 747 aircraft, there is a lump of uranium-238 that's used as some kind of counterweight somewhere in the, in the plane. Um, but it's it's a um, uh, it's it's definitely not of interest for nuclear physics uh, or nuclear uh, nuclear power or nuclear weapons or anything uranium two thirty eight. So the problem is when you have natural uranium, it's a mixture of two thirty five and two thirty eight. And so this is a case where you really care about which isotope you've got. So you have to you have to separate those isotopes. And uh, the main way to separate them that's used are these centrifuges, which spin the thing around and turn it into a gas. And it turns out that if you have a gas of uranium-235 and uranium-238, the uranium-235 the uranium goes a little bit faster than uranium-238 because it is, um, uh, 
because it has a little bit lower mass. So the given temperature goes a little bit faster. And in a centrifuge, when you spin it around, you can make the uranium-235 uh, go to the outside, I guess, and the uranium-238 goes to the inside. And that's how people with great effort separate um, uh, uranium-235 from uranium-238 and use it to make uh, for nuclear reactors or nuclear weapons. And so when you hear about countries that have been trying to um, uh, to refine uranium, to turn it into, for example, weapons grade uranium. Um, it's, uh, they typically will have big centrifuges um, that are used for um, a gaseous diffusion. Um, uh, the, am I mixing this up a bit? Uh, no, that, that's basically correct, what, I, what I'm saying. Um, the, uh, uh, the, there are a couple of different processes. There's one that just uses pure diffusion without centrifuges. Um, the, uh, during World War II, there were two different uh, methods that were tried uh, for separating out uranium-235 for, for, um, uh, for early nuclear weapons and different places, and, and, and they both, I think, are still in use. But centrifuges are the most common way. But anyway, so usually isotopes are just all mixed together. They have sort of the same properties and so on. When you get down to the very light elements, there are some differences, like um, uh, if you make water out of deuterium, you know, water is usually H2O, two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. Um, you can substitute for the hydrogen, you can substitute deuterium. And for example, you can get like D2O, which is um, uh, two deuterium atoms and an oxygen. Um, and that's so-called heavy water. And heavy water actually has a bunch of uses in nuclear reactors and things like that. Um, and uh, heavy water uh, has um, uh, heavy water is actually sufficiently chemically different that heavy water is is poisonous to to us and other organisms. If or at least if you have if you just have a little bit of heavy water, it doesn't really do anything. But if you have um, um, a uh, a whole bunch of heavy water and you start having heavy water substitute for the ordinary water in inside you, uh, the the usual biochemical reactions that make us go stop working with heavy water. So it's a case where there's a, a chemical difference between, between heavy water and, and light water. So for helium, helium-3 and helium-4 do have some very interesting differences. Um, okay, I, I will explain, uh, I, let me not go into this in too much detail, but most materials, when you cool them down, eventually they become, you know, let's say you have a gas, like, I don't know, oxygen in the air, you cool it down when it's sufficiently cold, it will turn into a liquid, you get liquid oxygen, when you cool it even further down, it will become a solid, and then it's a solid. Okay, so most materials have that property that as you cool them down, they turn from gas to liquid to solid. Um, sometimes they go straight from gas to solid, but in the end, when they're cold enough, they're always a solid. And that happens because the atoms in the material, they, you know, temperature is making them bounce around. Um, but when the temperature is low enough, they're just not moving very fast. And so the forces that bind the atoms together are strong enough that they can eventually, that they can um, keep, keep the atoms uh, in, in, a, in a rigid solid. Well, the, um, as, you, as you make the temperature lower and lower and lower, temperature is the average kinetic energy of materials, uh, of, of atoms. And so when the temperature goes down, goes down, goes down, eventually to absolute zero of temperature, minus 273.16 degrees centigrade, um, at that temperature, there is no more, there's no more kinetic energy left. The atoms are just stopped. Well, they would be stopped were it not for a fairly subtle effect in quantum mechanics uh, called zero point energy. And zero point energy is a consequence of the fact that in quantum mechanics, um, kind of you, you, in, a, in a limited period of time, you can't constrain the energy of something to be precisely a particular value. There is always some uncertainty in the energy and that manifests itself in this so-called zero point energy that exists independent of temperature. So even if the temperature is absolute zero, there's still some zero point energy. Okay, helium four is the unique known material that has the property that zero point energy, the zero point energy is sufficiently great in it that it never becomes a solid at ordinary pressures. So helium four, even at absolute zero, helium four is, uh, is still a liquid. Um, so that's, um, uh, and okay, so 
And one feature of it as a liquid, it has a very strange property. It's a so-called superfluid. And so what happens is in, let's see, basically it's another phenomenon of quantum mechanics. And it's a phenomenon very similar to the way a laser works. A laser is kind of a, like a superfluid, but with photons. And the way a laser, I think I talked about this another time, the way a laser uh, works, sort of all the photons in a laser all want to get in the same state. And they all want to kind of be all going in the same direction at the same, with the same color, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they all want to get together. That's because of the property of, of, of photons as quantum mechanical particles, they are uh, even, they're, they're integer spin particles. Okay, so uh, helium four, like uh, photons are what are called bosons. They're particles, the helium four nucleus has two protons, two neutrons. Each one has a spin of a half and together the whole thing, the spin's actually anti-aligned. So the spin of the whole thing is actually zero. And that's an integer. And that integer spin means that the thing is what's called a boson. And that means that the um, uh, bosons have this property that they all like to get together. And they always like to, to fermions, the other kind of thing which happens with half integer spins, um, they always like to be, they, ex, they have follow a thing called the exclusion principle and they like to kind of stay in different states, but bosons like to collect together. So if you have a liquid where all the atoms in it like to collect together and, and they like to sort of be doing the same thing, what happens? Well, you have what's called a superfluid. And the superfluid, once you start the thing moving, all the atoms will together coherently move and the viscosity, which usually slows down the motion of fluids by sort of a friction among atoms, just doesn't operate. Instead, it just all these atoms are collectively just moving, 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 and they keep moving. So superfluid helium-4 has this property. You can start a little vortex in superfluid helium-4, and if you start a little vortex in water or something like that, it will, it will slowly uh, decay out because of viscosity. In superfluid helium-4, that does not happen. The vortex would just keep going for months and it'll just keep circulating in the, in the superfluid. Um, and that happens below a certain temperature, the so-called lambda temperature of, of helium, uh, which is a few degrees Kelvin, a few degrees above absolute zero, two point something degrees Kelvin, I think, Kelvin's, um, a, a few degrees above absolute zero. Uh, helium four, it's always a liquid, um, but it makes this transition to being a superfluid. Um, so it doesn't, uh, so, and as a superfluid, it has no viscosity. It has, uh, you can get these things that circulate forever, all kinds of cool things like that. Okay, actually what happens is superfluid uh, above the, below the lambda temperature, some fraction of, the, of, of liquid helium is superfluid and the fraction increases you go towards absolute zero, but, but non-zero fraction becomes superfluid at the lambda point. The, then, um, okay, so what does this have to do with helium three? Well, helium three doesn't have, uh, it has just three particles each with spin a half. So the resulting spin of a helium three nucleus, I don't actually know, but I'm gonna guess it's a half. Um, the, uh, um, but anyway, it isn't an integer. And so that means that it isn't one of these bosons which has the property that likes to get together. Instead, it's a fermion which likes to exclude things. And so it doesn't have this property of making a superfluid, or at least you might not think it would, except for a very weird effect, which is that uh, pairs of, of helium-3 atoms can collect together and as a pair, they can make a boson and so they can make a, um, uh, a superfluid as well. And in fact, there are two phases of the superfluid, one in which the spins are, are aligned parallel, one in which they're anti-parallel. And um, in the so-called A phase of superfluid helium-3, um, you get this very weird effect where, the, where, the, where these little pairs of atoms in the superfluid have a net spin. And that leads to all kinds of weird um, weird effects, including one that I thought would allow one perhaps uh, to detect neutrinos from the nuclear reactors of nuclear submarines from or satellites in orbit. But fortunately, perhaps it doesn't work. But that will be a different story. All right. Oh, so many questions here. I'm sorry. I, I, I take a, these these questions are kind of hard to answer. So it takes me a little while to to answer some of them. Um, there's a question here. Can you explain the physics of why uh, 
Ice is slippery. Uh, slipperiness is a very slippery matter. Uh, when you have two solids, when you have solids, you just put them together in space where there's, and where there's, well, when there's no atmosphere in a vacuum, where there's no coating of anything, often two solids will just fuse together. The atoms and the two surfaces will end up being close enough together that it's as if they, the atoms were seeing atoms that were already in the same piece of solid and they'll just bind together and make the whole thing one sort of fused together solid. Um, but uh, normally in um, when we're you know, on earth in the atmosphere and so on, there's enough of a coating of, um, uh, of, of various kinds of um, uh, gases and things on the surface in addition, the surface tends not to be perfectly smooth. So the surface tends to have sort of a, a craggy sort of microscopic mountainscape, um, which causes the, the area of contact between the two surfaces not to be big enough for them to really fuse together very well. But in the case of ice, when ice gets slippery, the, the thing that, that happens there is that you have a layer of water, liquid water, and it acts like a lubricant. It's just like when you have oil or something, you have two cogs and they're both solid and they're, they're grinding against each other. If you want them to not grind as badly, you put oil, a liquid lubricant in between them. And then whenever there's sort of a space for, between the, the, the oil will have, um, so, so I should explain, one of the defining features of a solid is the atoms in it are rigidly arranged. A defining feature of a liquid is the atoms in it can kind of slide past each other. That's why you can have shear in a liquid. You can, you, can take, you can take a liquid, you can just sort of slide one part of it relative to the other, whereas you can't do that, uh, at least not easily with a solid. So, so that's why liquids can, once you have atoms which are in liquid form, they will behave like a lubricant and they'll be able to make things slippery. And that's what's happening in ice when it gets slippery is there's a layer of liquid water on top um, that, uh, uh, produces the the, the slipperiness. Um, I, I think that the uh, um, I'm kind of wondering whether there's any other effect that goes on with ice. Ice is a complicated material. So you think there's just water, there's ice, but there's actually many different forms of ice. The atoms inside the ice can be arranged in a variety of different ways. Um, so for example, ordinary ice, the atoms are arranged in a hexagonal way, but there are different forms of ice and depending on the pressure that the ice is under, so for example, in a glacier where there's ice under very high pressures, you can get different forms of ice. I think there are maybe on the order of 10 different crystal arrangements, different arrangements of atoms in ice that are known that happen at different pressures and, and temperatures and so on. Uh, in snowflakes, you kind of get to see the hexagonal structure of ice and snowflakes aren't quite like a bulk phase of ice because they're kind of they're kind of, you're seeing the surface of a snowflake, the surface is important as well. Uh, let's see, questions. Oh my gosh, so many questions here. Oh boy. Um, let's see, I'm gonna pick a random question here because there's so many interesting ones here. This is from uh, this is sort of relevant to what we've been talking about from Gondra, Gondra Hunter. Um, uh, can I explain the Van der Waals force? Okay, let's see if I can do this. So, uh, if you have two atoms, they're just ha happily hanging out. The two atoms, they will have a small force of attraction between them. And um, uh, even though that, so, so if, if atoms had, a, had some of their electrons missing or, or something, they could have a very strong force of attraction by electrical forces. They can have, one of them could have an electric charge and that they could, they could both have electric charges and the electric charges will produce strong forces between them. But if they're neutral atoms with equal numbers of electrons and protons in them, they won't have an electric charge. They won't have the ability to, to attract each other in that sort of direct electrical way. Okay, a tricky thing that happens. So you can have what's called an electric dipole. So electric dipole is something where you have some plus charge up here and some minus charge down here. 
you've separated out these charges. The total charge of the whole thing is still zero, but there's the the there's plus charge here and minus and, and, a, and a compensating amount of minus charge here. Well, if you imagine two electric dipoles, you've got a little bit of plus charge, a little bit of minus charge. You've got two electric dipoles. Well, if the minus part of one electric dipole can kind of see the plus part of the other electric dipole, then it'll get attracted to that and, and vice versa. Now, there'll also be, the, it'll be sort of correspondingly repelled from the other one. But if you work out the math of it, um, it turns out if you have two electric dipoles, they will have a force of attraction between them. Um, uh, well, it, it's, 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 attraction in some places, repulsion in other places. It depends on the configuration of the dipoles and so on. But um, you can have a, a net force of attraction. And roughly the, the force of attraction directly from electricity, from electric forces is, is goes like one over R squared, inverse square. It's the, as the distance increases, if the distance is R, you take the square of the distance, it's one over that is the force of attraction. For a dipole, the force of attraction is one over R cubed. Um, and uh, but so it, it falls off more quickly, but there's still a force of attraction. Okay, tricky thing about atoms. So an atom will be electrically neutral, but there'll be, a, as a result of quantum mechanics, there are little tiny fluctuations in which there's, the, in which basically the electrons are kind of deforming, so they're a little bit, it'll make a little dipole, then it'll go, disappear, make a little dipole, disappear. It'll be continually fluctuating around, but there's a little bit of polarization of the charge to make a little bit of an electric dipole. And that's always happening in, even in a, a neutral atom, which is otherwise, otherwise electrically neutral. So imagine you have an atom that has that sort of fluctuating dipole that, it, that inside it. Well, it turns out that fluctuating dipole, when, when one atom has a, a dipole, an electric dipole moment as it's called, that will induce, that will cause another atom to kind of have its plus and minus charges separate out a little bit. The forces from one dipole will cause a force of um, uh, forces to make the other dipole, uh, make, make the other atom have some dipole uh, associated with it. Okay, so the effect of the first atom on the second atom uh, is a one over R cubed effect. It's because it's a dipole force from one atom to the other. Okay, but so that atom kind of makes its own friend because it, it kind of has created a dipole moment. This, this atom over here is, is fluctuating and, and temporarily having a dipole moment. It causes a dipole moment to happen in the atom over here. And uh, then they both got dipole moments because this one's fluctuating, this one's had an induced dipole moment. And then there's a force because there are two dipoles, there's a force between these atoms. And so when you work it out, there's a one over R cubed effect from the original fluctuating atom on the other one. Then the other atom, its force relative to the first one is another one over R cubed. So the result is a one over R to the six force law. And so when atoms, the typical forces between atoms are roughly like one over R to the power six. Actually, it's a little trickier than that. Um, what happens is the effect of one atom on the other can propagate only at the speed of light. And as a result of relativity theory, it turns out that it is actually one over R to the seventh force law rather than one over R to the six, because essentially by the time the effect of one dipole, one dipole has on the other has happened, the, the, um, uh, there's been a, a sort of a, it, it took some time for that effect to happen. And by the time it sort of feeds back to the to have a force on the other thing. The dipole has changed a bit, and the result of that is that it goes from one of R to the six to one of R to the seven. But so roughly, there's there's that kind of force between even neutral atoms. And and there's a when you try and work out, you try and approximate, you know, what is the force between atoms? Well, there's a there's a force of attraction. If you try and do the do the sort of simulation of a solid, there's a force of attraction that's about one over R to the six. When atoms get very close together they tend to repel each other, uh, uh, mainly as a result of this exclusion principle thing that I mentioned where the electrons don't want to be sort of smooshed together. Um, that's a one over R to the 12th effect more or less. So roughly the, the sort of uh, uh, forces between atoms are like one over R to the six minus one over R to the 12th roughly. So there's, there's a range in which they attract and then there's a sort of hard core in which they repel. And when you look at atoms in a solid, they're pretty much sitting in that minimum 
but where the one over r to the six force law is causing them to be pulled together, but they haven't yet been pushed apart by the one over r to the 12th force law. That's called for people who, who follow these things, it's called the Leonard Jones potential, is this one over r to the six minus one over r to the 12th type potential between atoms. So that was a little bit technical, but that's, that's a, um, it's a description of, of Van der Waals forces. Um, let's see. Uh, my gosh, so many questions here. Um, oh boy. Here's one I can do easily from Bean. Um, I recently drew a social network from in graph 3D in Mathematica, but when I put in more than 1200 nodes, all my nodes became blue. Is this a bug? No, it's not. It's a, it's a setting for, if you look at the options for graph 3D, it's one of the settings. It tries to not burn your computer alive um, by having it um, try to draw a huge number of very elaborately drawn um, uh, spherical nodes. There's a setting to, to do that. Um, I'm going to answer just a couple of other questions here. Um, there's a question here from The Chemist, uh, it's sort of in the theme of some of the other ones I've been answering today. The question is, does quantum mechanical tunneling play much of a role in nuclear fusion? All right, so it's a little bit complicated, but I'm going to try to explain a little bit. Yeah, okay, let's see if I can do this. Okay, so if you try and roll a ball up a hill, if you, if you have give the ball enough momentum, you can, you can imagine if you make the ball go fast enough, then for a certain height of hill, the ball will get to the top of the hill and roll over. If you don't give the, hill enough, uh, the ball enough momentum, it won't get to the top of the hill, it will just stop and maybe it'll start rolling back down again. Okay, so in ordinary physics, to get over a barrier, like a hill, for example, you have to give something a bunch of energy or momentum. You have to be, be having it go fast enough that it gets over the barrier of that hill. And there's a definite energy at which it will get over the barrier based on the height of the barrier, the mass of the thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. In quantum mechanics, the, the main defining feature of quantum mechanics is it's not a theory in which only definite things happen. It's a theory in which there's a whole branching collection of different possible things that might happen. And the things that we see happen are just a particular choice of those things which might have happened. And by the way, in our theory of physics, we have a much tighter view of how quantum mechanics works. And um, uh, in fact, the phenomenon you're asking about tunneling it's actually an interesting thing for us to look at in the context of our theory of physics. Um, and I think I can explain to you how tunneling works in a way that, um, uh, but I haven't actually formally done this with our theory of physics. I haven't, we haven't looked at that phenomenon yet, and we should. Um, the, uh, but in any case, in quantum mechanics, this picture of the ball is being pushed up the hill. Will it get to the top? Does it have enough energy? Uh, it either In classical mechanics, it either does or it doesn't. In quantum mechanics, the, the ball is effectively testing out many different paths, many different things that could have happened, okay? So some of those things involve the ball having uh, managed to just go through the barrier, ignoring the fact that it didn't have enough energy to go through the barrier. Now, in our theory of physics, um, what's happening is there are uh, paths of history that branch out in this thing we call branchial space, which is kind of a, a, a thing like physical space, except not like physical space. It's a space of quantum possibilities instead of the physical space of positions that we're used to. So in this branchial space, what's happening is that some of the possible uh, things that could happen to your ball are actually going through the barrier and coming out the other side. Well, it turns out that uh, in, in quantum mechanics, you can have a certain probability 
for even though the ball wouldn't classically make it to the top of the barrier and go over, even though it wouldn't do that, there's still a certain probability that it will get through the barrier. Okay, that probability turns out to be as you as you increase the the energy difference associated with the barrier, it's an exponentially small probability that it makes it through the barrier. And um, uh, as the as the energy difference increases, it becomes exponentially much smaller the probability for it to make it through the barrier. So in nuclear fusion, for example. The question of whether when you, if you want two protons to be able to really smoosh themselves together, they have to get over this barrier associated with the force of repulsion from electricity from the two protons. And so one way that can happen is through tunneling, this process of quantum mechanical process, where with some exponentially small probability, the, the protons can just end up getting through the barrier and, and coming together. Uh, some, uh, what's a good example of an alpha emitter? I think americium-241, which is the um, uh, uh, which is the isotope that is found in, at least used to be found in smoke detectors. I don't think it is anymore. Um, it was uh, was americium-241, which I believe is an alpha emitter. It's a um, uh, um, it's a it's an element which decays by emitting alpha particles, which are these helium-4 nuclei, and one of the really weird things about alpha emitters is that some of them have lifetimes of a billionth of a second, and some of them have lifetimes of a billion years. So a huge range of different lifetimes, all associated with just spitting out an alpha particle from a nucleus. And the reason there's such a big range of variation of lifetimes is because that decay is happening through quantum tunneling. And the, um, uh, and the chance of quantum tunneling varies exponentially with this energy difference. So even though the energy differences may not be that great, the, the probabilities differ exponentially with that energy difference. And that exponential change of probabilities is what leads to this very wide range of different um, uh, lifetimes. Um, oh, there's another simple question here. Uh, Gosh, there's so many interesting questions here from pharmaceuticals, music. Are you planning on releasing the raw data of all the simple programs uh, that I generated working on my book, A New Kind of Science? Um, most of the programs are actually already in the, uh, the notes at the back of the book. But yes, we have a systematic project of going through all of the code that I wrote for New Kind of Science, which still runs happily today, and just cleaning it up and... and um, and posting it. We've kind of been hoping that, um, I mean, we're, uh, we might just make the raw code available, but it's a little bit messy because it's been set up specifically to make the pictures that are in the book. Um, actually, just this morning, I was talking about that as a project for uh, an intern that we have to, um, uh, to go through, it's been a long time project, to go through all the code that I produced in the 10 years that I was working on that book and, and make it um, uh, clean and, and available. Um, uh, boy, you guys are asking so many interesting questions here. There's a question about muon catalyzed fusion, which I'd love to answer, but I'll, we need to keep these for another time. Um, there's a question from Aram about when the Andromeda galaxy collides with the Milky Way, what's going to happen to life on Earth? Probably nothing much. You know, galaxies are very diverse, diffuse, except in the center of the galaxy where there's a big black hole and quite a high density of stars. Most of the time, galaxies just pass through each other. They, you know, it might be that there'll be a higher density of stars in our night sky, but I don't think there'll be much other effect. Um, so there's a question here. Um, I thought I would just answer one or two more. Um, Oh gosh, there's a question here from Paul. What advice would you give someone who is starting to study analysis from scratch, i.e. from the Zermelo-Frenkel axioms and so on? 
that's really a question about the really foundational theory of mathematics. As it happens, I am very actively working on that right now, um, because what we've discovered is that there is a tremendous parallelism between our theory of physics and a theory of metamathematics, a theory of sort of the, the structure of mathematics and mathematical proof. And in a sense, as we, in mathematics, it's kind of, there's this infinite network of, of things that are true, of theorems that are true. And in the physical universe, there's sort of this infinite space time network of events that happen in the history of the universe. And as the universe evolves, we are sampling more and more of that sort of infinite network. As the field of mathematics advances, we are in a sense sampling more and more of its infinite network. And I've been trying to understand the analogy between these two networks and the extent to which we can use thinking from physics to th think about mathematics in bulk. So maybe even by next week, I'll have more to say about that. Uh, uh, check out, um, when, I, when I finally have untangled this, I will post something about it. Um, Uh, there was a question. Um, about there was one question I just wanted to. Um, uh, it's a question here from Gary. Um, all right, I'm going to I'm going to try two more questions here. So question here from Gary. He says, speak about Einstein's correct prediction of the perihelion of Mercury when people realized Einstein's theory was better than Newton's. What might be the equivalent for the Wolfram Physics Project? Well, so history never precisely repeats itself. So what happened, let me tell you the story of, of um, uh, Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity, was introduced in 1915 and is still riding high as the only and best theory of gravity that we have. And it's explained all kinds of things like the merger of black holes that produced gravitational waves that were observed a few years ago, all those kinds of things. It's done fantastically well. It's had a hard time being reconciled with quantum mechanics. I think we finally understand how that reconciliation works. But if we look at the history of Einstein's general theory of relativity, it is a very elegant mathematical theory. When it was first introduced, it's like, this is a nice elegant mathematical theory. What does it mean? Well, there were a few predictions it had. One of the predictions that Einstein really hated was it predicted that the universe in its simplest form, it predicted the universe would expand. And Einstein was like, that can't possibly be right. The, obviously the universe isn't expanding. So he added this piece to his equations, it's called the cosmological term, that was specifically put in there as kind of a clue to prevent the universe expanding. So about a decade and a half later, Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe. And, um, uh, and then Einstein was like, that was a big mistake on my part. I should never have added this cosmological term. I should just put, put a stake in the ground and said, the universe is going to be expanding, but he wasn't ready to do that. So there were other predictions. So another prediction that his theory made was that when light goes around the sun, light feels the force of gravity and there was already a prediction from the pre-existing theory of gravity, Newton's theory of gravity, that light will be bent as it goes around the sun. But in Einstein's theory of gravity, he predicted in the end that light will be bent by a factor of two more than Newton's theory would predict. Essentially because light feels both an electric force, an electric light gravitational force and a magnetic light gravitational force. And for light, those are equal. And so it's a factor of two difference. Okay, the first time Einstein worked this out, he got a different answer. Didn't get a factor of two. Okay, so how do you observe the bending of light around the sun? Well, during a total solar eclipse, the disk of the sun is covered. And so when there's a star that comes just behind the sun, you can see that star because it's not, you're not blinded by the light of the sun. You can see that star and you can see was the apparent position of that star deflected that would correspond to light from the star having been bent as it goes around the sun. So the question then is, what, uh, how much was the light going to be bent? And there was a total solar eclipse in 1916. And um, uh, there was a whole expedition to go observe the bending of light around the sun and test Einstein's theory. Uh, well, uh, fortunately for Einstein, that was right in the middle of World War I. 
and it was, I think it was in Crimea, uh, part of, part of um, uh, it's geographically uh, in Ukraine. Um, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the thing that, um, um, uh, but in any case, it was in the middle of World War I and uh, needless, and I think there was some, um, I forget, Americans maybe on this, but I don't really remember the full, full historical details. But anyway, the, fortunately for Einstein, the expedition never, never managed to make an observation there. Equipment was impounded by some, who knows what, what, what happened, some messy thing that happened in the middle of a war that was going on around people attempting to observe light being bent around the sun. Around the sun. So, uh, Fortunately for Einstein, that observation was never made because at the time, his calculation of what should happen was wrong. And what would have happened is people would have said, oh, you know, even if they'd observed light being bent by a factor of two more, they would have said, oops, Einstein's theory is wrong because it predicts something different because the calculation had been done wrong. Okay, well, 1919 comes around. That was after the end of World War I and a chap called Arthur Eddington, a British physicist, very keen on, you know, uh, sort of bring the scientists together, even if there was a war, we're going to, you know, we British scientists are going to prove that, um, uh, the, you know, that German science is, is, is predicting good things and so on. We'll do this expedition to South Africa where there was going to be a, a total solar eclipse and we'll observe the bending of light around the sun. Probably those experiments were kind of fudged. Probably they, they couldn't have done experiments as, as, as well as they claimed that they were doing them. But in any case, that experiment said, great, we found it. We got exactly the result the general relativity would predict. And so um, uh, that was sort of a, a, a triumph for general relativity. There was another effect, the advance of the perihelion of Mercury. I'll just explain what that is. So when the Earth goes around the sun, uh, people say it, it goes well. The Earth goes around the sun and roughly in a circle. But it isn't exactly a circle. It's a little bit distorted. It's a little bit an ellipse. And so an ellipse, so the Earth is going around the sun in an ellipse, okay? But so an ellipse has sort of an elongated uh, uh, semi-major axis and a semi-minor axis. Those are the analogs of the diameter. The, if, if it was a circle, the semi-major axis and semi-minor axis would be identical, but um, they're like the radii, the two different radii of the ellipse, okay? So when the Earth goes around the sun, to a very good approximation, the ellipse that corresponds to the Earth going around the sun is fixed in place. The sun is here, the ellipse is there, the, the major axis of the ellipse does not, um, does not move at all. It just, it's always kept in that the Earth just keeps going around and around and around in this, in this pattern. And that's a feature of inverse square law of gravity. If you have an inverse square law of attraction, the, uh, it's, uh, it, the, that has a special conservation law um, that in addition to conserving energy and momentum and angular momentum, things like that, it conserves a thing, mathematical name, the Runge lens vector, which is basically says that the, um, the, the axis of the ellipse always stays pointed in the same direction. The axis of the ellipse never changes. So that's pretty in a very close approximation true for the earth. Okay, Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, is much closer to the sun. And uh, I, I should say that, and, and so, okay, I, I should say that if there's a, this is a feature, this preservation of this direction of the major axis of the ellipse is a consequence of an inverse square law of gravity. As soon as there's a deviation from an inverse square law of gravity, it's no longer true. The, the axis of the ellipse moves over time. It, it processes over time. Okay, so for, for the earth, very close to an inverse square law. For Mercury, which is much closer to the sun, other effects from the gravity of the sun can come into it, can, can happen. And so Mercury, in addition to having a one over R squared force law for its gravity, has a little bit of one over R cubed force law as well. And the result of that one over R cubed force law is that there is a precession in the ellipse that corresponds to the orbit of Mercury. And the perihelion of Mercury, which is the, the place on the ellipse where Mercury is closest to the sun, that perihelion will process, it will move around in successive orbits. And so that's what the advance of the perihelion of Mercury is that motion, that change as in successive orbits of the position of the perihelion, the position of the closest approach to the sun for Mercury. And that advance of the perihelion is associated with changes from the inverse square law of gravity.
Okay, so the inverse square law is, is true for a certain a, a sphere of mass and so on, but there are corrections to it when the gravitational field has deformations. In fact, I already mentioned in talking about dipoles, for electric dipoles, there are similar gravitational effects. And so when you see the perihelion and mercury advancing, it's not completely obvious. It's a, it's a calculation. It's a complicated piece of astrophysics to verify that, no, that's not a feature of the shape of the sun. It's a feature of changes in the law of gravity. So that was a little bit of an, a subtle thing to untangle. But in any case, the, um, so one thing that the big sort of message of this is to make a prediction from a theory requires a big stack of calculations on top of the theory. And sometimes those calculations are hard to do. I mean, famously in Newton's theory of gravity, Newton tried to compute the motion of the moon and he managed to get this position of the, the apse of the moon, which is basically this, this perihelion type thing, um, but, but with respect to the earth, um, he managed to get that wrong by a factor of two with his calculations. His theory was correct, but his calculations were wrong. And they were not wrong in that particular case because he made some arithmetic mistake. They were wrong because it's just really hard to do those calculations. And it took 150 more years before people developed the kind of mathematical tools to be able to do those calculations well and to show that Newton's theory of gravity did correctly predict what had been observed in the motion of the moon. So it's tricky to get predictions from theories that can be tested experimentally. It goes far beyond the actual theory itself. In our theory of physics, the, the most impressive and spectacular things that are happening now are what one might call theoretical predictions. You know, there's, a, there's hundreds of years of physics that have been done, particularly impressive physics in the 20th century, and that have led to conclusions like quantum tunneling, like general relativity, like these kinds of things. And the question for our theory is, can we account for, can we use our theory, which has very little that goes into it, and can we do the computations necessary to get those features of known 20th century physics? And that's going spectacularly well. Now, can we predict things that weren't known from 20th century physics? Yes, we can. Unfortunately, many of those things require a scale parameter. So for example, when Einstein was thinking about the cosmological constant, he didn't know how big it would be. We still don't completely know how big it is, but it's, a, it's an extra parameter in the theory, an extra number you have to put in. So for us, we have one extra number, which is the maximum entanglement speed. In physical space, the maximum speed that information can propagate at is the speed of light. In our branchial space of quantum states, the maximum speed information can propagate at is this thing we call maximum entanglement speed, we call it zeta. Um, and it has, so we don't know its value. We can, we've got a, a rough estimate that its value might be 10 to the five solar masses per second. Um, it's in funny units because it's a funny kind of quantity, um, but um, uh, we don't know that value. If we knew that value, we could make immediate predictions about all kinds of things. So with that value, we can make predictions about black hole mergers, the rate of how black hole mergers can happen, deviations from what happens in, in uh, uh, Einsteinian gravity uh, uh, as a, uh, around black holes, a bunch of different predictions for that. But those predictions depend on this parameter. Um, we can also potentially make predictions about quantum computers if we know that parameter. Um, we can show things about the extent to which quantum computers can work. Um, they may it still may be the case that what we're seeing in labs for quantum computers is miles and miles away from, from the theoretical prediction limits and so on, I don't know. Um, there are potentially some predictions that can be made that are scale independent, that don't depend on these extra parameters. Uh, ironically enough, I think one of them might have to do with photons in orbit around a black hole. So it's very much the same as Einstein's idea about we've got light going around a, a star, but this is a little bit more ornate because there's actually photons trapped in orbit around a black hole. And um, there is some reason to believe that when you have pairs of photons trapped in that kind of orbit, that they will have certain quantum correlations that simply weren't there in Einstein's theory of gravity. Uh, but we haven't worked that out completely and it's, it's non-trivial to work these things out. So I, I, was, I was thinking of writing something actually about sort of the stack of what's involved in, is your theory right? Um, because one of the things that's really cool with our theory is that, um, uh, okay, so when you compute 
something like these two black holes that crashed into each other, you know, a third of the way across the universe and produced these gravitational waves that we detected. The computation of that is a complicated computer calculation actually it uses our, uh, our, our computational language a lot in, in doing that um, when people actually do that in practice. But um, in any case, the actual computation of, of this merger of black holes is a big complicated thing where you're taking Einstein's equations for gravity and you're turning them into a form that computers can digest. And so you're not just using pure math to solve those equations, you're digesting them for a computer and then solving them on a computer. Okay, so our theory says there's actually a more direct way to do it. You can go directly from our theory, which is really a computer friendly theory from the beginning, directly go and compute the mergers of black holes. So it's as if you can, you can have a different approach to doing that same computation. Now we know mathematically that we should get the same answer, at least if we, if we do the calculation precisely enough as the one that we get from general relativity, but both involved for general relativity, we have to sort of digest it, approximate it for a computer. For our theory, we have to get a big version that sort of approaches what, what, what happens for general relativity. And essentially what we're doing is we're sort of writing a compiler that goes to, we're sort of compiling the equations of general relativity down to our model, but we can actually then run the sort of compiled code in our model to see to see whether to make predictions like about black hole mergers. So one of the things I think is going to happen is that our models are actually going to provide practical methods for doing computations in general relativity and if also in quantum mechanics that are better than methods we've had before. And so essentially we'll be going directly from our model to the answer, even though in the intermediate stage, we know that our model mathematically should reproduce general relativity. So it's sort of unsurprising that this works, but it is an impressive thing that we can go directly from our model without really ever having to talk about general relativity directly to predictions. Um, and so that's something I think will happen in practice probably sooner rather than later. Um, Okay, I'm gonna answer one more. Um, and so somebody is, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm almost gonna take this challenge. Somebody is saying here that Newton doesn't hold a candle to Mr. Einstein. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very complicated thing to, to, to discuss the sort of achievements of different scientists and how surprising or not they were. I mean, the, the um, you know, and often the, the drama of what they achieved is not obvious in the later history. So for example, for Newton, the big drama of what he achieved was to say, you can use fancy math to work out how things are gonna happen in physics. There was some, a certain amount of fancy math before Newton, but he said, I need even fancier math, and he invented calculus to, uh, to figure out what's going to happen in physics. But the big idea was you can use fancy math to figure out what's going to happen in physics. Einstein, uh, some part of what he did, important kind of thing that he did was to say, you can just reason about things in physics and figure stuff out. So for example, in inventing relativity, you know, sort of thought experiments like you shine, a f you're running at the speed of light and you shine a flashlight. How fast does the light from the flashlight go? Those kinds of sort of thought experiments. He thought about things in these kinds of almost logical ways and was able to kind of build a theory that ended up using some of the current mathematics of its time to kind of figure things out in terms of sort of a logical theory. And that was sort of a new thing at that time because by then things have been sort of very much made, made very mathematical. I mean, I think in, um, uh, in the kinds of things we're trying to do now, uh, it's sort of a, a different paradigm that comes from ideas about computation that sort of it's, it's in a sense too easy because once you really understand that computational paradigm, you, and I'm not sure we completely really understand it yet, but once you have a, a decent understanding of it, there are things which have just seemed utterly mysterious before, which now it's like, oh, well, it's kind of obvious because we know from this sort of computational paradigm, this is how things work. Um, Let's see. I think there was a question about um, uh, sort of a life and times question, which I was just going to end on. Oh my gosh, where was this? Okay, here's one from Icy. 
Um, what gave you the confidence to study physics since you were a kid? What advice uh, would you give a, have a kid give a kid interested in learning that has an internet connection and a Raspberry Pi computer? Um, the main advice I would give is, you know, learn this computational language we've built that sort of the world's kind of high-end researchers use and, and we've used to, to make the progress we've made, learn our Wolfram language and use it to figure out things nobody's ever figured out before. And because it's a new set of tools, there's just an unbelievably wide open area of questions that can be asked. And for example, exploring different simple programs and what they do. I mean, I've been doing that now for 40 years and I'm not even a, you know, a tiny distance into scratching the surface of what can be figured out. And once you kind of get the methodology for how to explore how simple programs work, there's just this vast ocean of things to understand. And by the way, if you do a good job of that and you understand something where you're taking a very simple program and understanding what it does, it's sort of inevitable that at some point in the future, maybe even soon, somebody's gonna say, wow, this thing that I have, it's kind of like this very simple program. And if the program is simple enough, it's sort of inevitable you'll, you'll hit it. Um, that's the thing I have. Oh, somebody studied how this works. Now I understand how the thing that I'm trying to study works. So it's sort of inevitable. If you, if you do a good job of studying a sufficiently simple program that it's going to be important for something in the future. I think in terms of my uh, sort of, I think the thing that really helps in studying things is just go figure out something new. And my point is that, you know, with this whole computational language technology stack, it is possible for anybody who learns that to figure out something new in a lot of different areas. It's particularly easy in the sort of abstract exploration of the computational universe, but you can do it studying data, go study pandemic data, go study all kinds of things. You know, there are things you can figure out because you have tools that are really giving you sort of a superpower relative to what people have had in the past. There is the ability to figure out more. And this is something summer camp, for example, uh, where it's like 40 something kids, I think we had this year, you can go look on the web, and you can see all the cool things that kids at our summer camp figured out, um, or, or did. Uh, and that's in, in, a, in a couple of week period. Um, and that's um, kind of an example of yes, you know, kids can figure stuff out, you know, take your computer uh, open language is, is bundled on the Raspberry Pi. You can, it exists on every Raspberry Pi. Just go start computing things. Go start wondering about questions and just try and see if you can figure out the answers. Maybe you won't know enough to know that the question you're asking is a question that was answered 100 years ago, or maybe last year, or maybe three weeks ago, or maybe it hasn't been answered. That doesn't really matter. The first thing is just to get into the habit of being able to use the tools well enough that you can answer questions that haven't been answered before. And it, you know, I've had the, the, the pleasure of seeing a whole lot of young people get to the point where they can do that. And it's really neat. It's, it's kind of like a superpower. Um, and uh, I think that the, um, uh, uh, you know, that I would say in, in today's times, that is the best way to get confidence about sort of figuring out new things and doing research and so on is um, uh, um, is by just you know doing it. There's a very soft target that's provided by the computational language that that we've that we've built. Now you know, uh, there's also the question of what what about all that physics? You know, do you understand how uh, I don't know uh, the path integral works or how um, you know the uh, uh, grand canonical ensemble works in statistical mechanics or how, you know, all kinds of fancy names and fancy things and so on. Well, uh, you know, as you learn more, it all eventually fits together, but it may take a while to get to the point where for something like physics, it's a big old field, there's a lot known, you know, you won't know every corner of physics for a long, long time. I'm sure I don't know every corner of physics. Um, I know a decent number of corners because at one time or another, I've been interested in different corners of physics, but I'm sure there are ones I don't know. 
Um, and uh, in fact, I can already think of some. Um, but, uh, uh, and for example, in mathematics, there are plenty of corners I don't know. Mathematics is in some ways a more diverse, bigger subject than physics. It has more, more sort of tentacles that are reached in different directions um, that probably even than physics has. So for example, one thing, I was for a long time afraid of this thing called category theory, which is a, a, very, uh, a very kind of formal, pure approach to mathematics that originated uh, as in the 1950s and 60s, even 1940s, um, but it's become popular. Uh, it's, had, it's ebbed and flowed in popularity. It's become popular again um, because of uh, a relationship to a thing called type theory, which again is quite old, but has been, again, has become popular because of thinking about computer languages, and then I think it's a, actually a bad way to think about computer languages, but then as a way of, of thinking about certain kinds of formalization in mathematics. Anyway, I've been afraid of category theory for years. And I kind of talk to people about category theory and they explain all pieces of category theory and I don't really get it. I haven't really got it. I haven't understood. Oh, there are these morphisms and there are functors between, between categories and there are morphisms within a category and there are endofunctors and there are groupoids and there are um, symmetric monoidal categories and all kinds of very fancy sounding things. I realized um, uh, category theory is very Greek. It has a lot of words in it that have Greek roots, which is kind of nice actually. I, I really like the words of category theory. I just haven't understood what they meant before. Well, I'm happy to say that finally, I think in this past week actually, I finally got up, to the, I finally climbed that hill. I finally think I understand the sort of the core ideas of category theory quite well. Um, and, but it took me a long, long time. And it, it really, what was needed was I kept on hearing little pieces. I kept on studying little things. It's a theory that's very abstract. So if you, if you start off just saying, I'm gonna study category theory, you know, let me just understand you know, the definition of a morphism. Okay, why are we making this definition? I don't have a clue. Um, you you kind of have to work at it a piece at a time. And, and for me, I mean, I always find a lot of fun. You know, I've been around more years than I, that I might like to to uh, uh, this point, but but you know I've I've learned a lot of different things, and the thing that is always remarkable is one of these areas that I just don't know, and sometimes even these areas. I mean, category theory. I have to admit I've been afraid of for a long time. Actually, quite a lot of professional mathematicians are afraid of category theory too, um, and there's this process called categorification that people sometimes talk about, which is kind of a way of taking ideas in mathematics. And, and putting them in this sort of form of category theory. Um, and uh, the, um, the thing that um, uh, it's kind of a, it's, it's sort of a scary thing to categorify things because it makes things very, very, very abstract um, and, and, and very hard to understand in, in concrete terms. But anyway, I, it's to say that, that um, you know, so this is something where it, for me, it's like I heard about category theory first probably oh, 40 something years ago. And I've been kind of meaning to understand it ever since. And I finally now kind of understand it, I think. Um, and uh, it's sort of interesting how that can happen. And it, it, it like, it did take a while. And now that I understand it, I can, you know, see a bunch of things in it. I can see how it relates to some of these things we've been doing in physics. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, one of, the, one of the sort of higher reaches of category theory is this thing called the infinity groupoid which is kind of a limit of the, uh, you have ordinary category theory, which is okay, it's, or, it's very, very abstract. And then you start going to higher category theory, two categories, three categories, four categories. Eventually you get to the infinity category. Uh, and that leads to this infinity groupoid, which is just this super abstract thing. And, and we've realized in recent times that the infinity groupoid is actually related to a thing we call the Rulial multiway system, which we invented as part of our physics theory. And that sort of actually gives one a concrete understanding of the, of the infinity groupoid that makes it clear why it's, well, it makes it, gives an argument for why it's relevant in, in, in physics and in mathematics. And there are, there's a thing called the homotopy hypothesis or Grothendieck's hypothesis, which is a deeply, deeply abstract hypothesis about the infinity groupoid that um, is, uh, looks like we kind of understand, you know, why does this relate to anything? And we kind of understand that now um, or beginning to understand that. And it's, it's, it's really a neat thing. And it's, it's something where, you know, just because I didn't understand category theory for 40 years doesn't mean I can't understand it now. And, um, that's, uh, um, and that's sort of a, an interesting story of that. Um, 
All right. Well, I think uh, I should wrap up now. We've saved up a lot of questions that um, um, uh, we can perhaps um, um, uh, go on with um, uh, uh, next week. Well, thanks for thanks for joining me. Thanks for asking lots of interesting questions. You know, I hope you guys find this interesting. I find this really interesting because you get you get to ask me things that I have never explained to anybody before. I get to try and explain them, and every time I explain something, I understand a little bit better, um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, give you an opportunity to understand some of these things too. So. Uh, Thank you all and look forward to seeing you again next week.